Hi, everyone. Welcome to the APX Pitch Tuesday. This is our weekly startup pitch competition we do here at APX with all the startups we work with to help them improve their public speaking and to get direct feedback from the audience, from you. And you have a chance to get to know the European startup scene a little bit better. This Pitch Tuesday is special. It's a female founder special, also follow, followed by a panel discussion. Um, the Pitch Tuesday today will have six female founders pitch, and then we'll have a panel discussion with some very interesting guests. It's done in partnership today with the Better Future Conference, which is a conference taking place in November this year, focused on female uh, leadership. Better Future Conference is done with Belt am Sonntag and its partner Porsche, and they are the ones also making this event possible today, together with us here, us here at APX. My name is Soren, and I work here for APX. I lead communications and branding. I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to what we do here at APX. So APX is one of Europe's leading early stage investors and startup accelerator programs. And we're a joint venture of Axel Springer and Porsche. We're based here in Berlin, and we're always looking for great companies to invest in. We invest into digital companies across industries, often as the first investor, and help the startups grow. This we do by giving them 50K of cash, uh, access to our extensive network of mentors, experts, and investors, and a tailor-made growth program for each startup. This in, in exchange for 5% equity. This is our team. Um, we span over five different nationalities, and uh, we have quite different backgrounds. We have that thing in common, though, that we love to help startups grow. And so far, we have invested into more than 60 startups, ranging from a lot of different uh, industries. Uh, actually, we are at 68 investments at the moment. Enough with the talking. This is the program for today. We'll start out with the Pitch Tuesday competition, which will have um, six startups pitch. It will take around 40 minutes, um, and that will be a very exciting prize for the winner in the end. Um, this will be followed by a panel discussion on that uh, panel will have uh, Patricia Renard, who is head of industry solutions at Porsche Digital, Johannes Boy, who is editor in chief at Welt am Sonntag, Melanie Skröder, who is director of portfolio and financing here at APX, and finally Tina Spiesmarger, who is founder of Unown. Um, there will be a little time after the panel for a QA with the panelists, and we expect to end around uh, 6.30. So on behalf of our partners and APX, welcome all of you. We hope this will be a really nice, nice event. And I am now going to pass it over to my great colleagues, Elena and Paulina for the Pitch Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zer. Uh, hi, this is Paulina from APX. Hello, this is Elena. Um, so Welcome to APX Female Founders uh, Pitch Tuesday. As Zürn already stated, Pitch Tuesday is our uh, weekly showcase event where our portfolio companies can present themselves. But this Pitch Tuesday is a really special edition. So first of all, it's all about female founders today, which you might have guessed already. And second of all, besides having three portfolio companies of ours pitching, we also opened our stage to three external companies. And those companies we actually met at a previous event, which was VCs for Female Founders Initiative, hosted by APX and Joint Capital. So as a little thank you for the, for the pitches, we actually provided pitch training to the companies. Uh, and let us see how this goes. Yes, so as Zern and Paulina mentioned, today you will see six presentations of about three minutes each. And after that, you will have the chance to ask your questions to our awesome founders by posting them in the chat. And also you will be asked to vote for the best pitch. And today we have a very special prize, a Porsche driving experience for four people. So the winner of the best pitch and the lucky three people that she will bring with her, will be able to select two Porsche models to drive at the Porsche Experience Center in Hockenheim where they will also have an instructor to show them how to get the most out of this driving experience. So now that we are all excited about the prize, without further ado, let's welcome on stage Tina, co-founder of Unknown, one of our portfolio companies. And she will tell us how, thanks to the fashion leasing platform Unknown, we don't have to choose anymore between style and sustainability. 
Tina, are you ready? Hi. Yeah, I'm ready. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, I'm Tina. I'm the co-founder of Unown, and we built Europe's first lifestyle platform for the non-ownership generation. We give you the freedom of owning less by circulating products for brand and manufacturers. So why is there a need for that kind of service platform? So we think uh, looking at the market and what's happening, you see two problems. First, you have consumers who, especially in the fashion space, are looking for more sustainable solutions, but they don't want to sacrifice on affordability, variety and convenience, obviously. And then you have the industry on the other hand, and the industry sits on tons of unused overstock, producing more and more waste every year, and they slowly adapt to sustainable practices. And actually this part of the problem has been really accelerated by the current uh, global pandemic. We solve both problems. For the consumers, we offer a sustainable fashion service. They can subscribe to our platform, um, use our leasing service, have access to a fashion footprint tool, and also use smart wardrobe management features. For the brands, we offer them on our platform based on a revenue share model access to a great community of people who have a conscious lifestyle and looking for sustainable solutions. And they can actually like, circulate their inventory um, based on our smart tracking. So at any point they know where items are and use our software to manage their inventory and make sure they make the most out of the leasing platform. For both actually, we work on a data model and we have a impact board for consumers so they can actually see what good they are doing if they're leasing instead of buying. And the same goes for our partner brands who can also quantify their impact. We are looking at three dimensions. We are quantifying CO2 emissions. Our goal is to save 20,000 tons of CO2 um, emissions until 2024. We are also looking at waste and we are looking at water consumption. How we actually make money. So we do have a three tier subscription model for the consumer facing service. Um, we also do secondhand sales. So if you lease items on our platform, you can also buy them. And we do have the B2B software, which is currently free of use. Our current traction, so we have over 600 um, members and customers, paying customers. On average, they stay for 4.5 months and we make 360 euros over a lifetime. We work with over 30 brands and we're onboarding new brands every month onto our platform. We feel that momentum is big for that kind of service and that Europe actually is just getting started in that space. We see ourselves um, in the sweet spot between offering B2B solutions, but also access to a uh, strong community and to um, customers who are looking for uh, um, the freedom of owning less. What makes us different? We position ourselves as the end-to-end -end solution for brands and people. So we have our software for our partners. We have our impact tool that sits at the heart of everything we do. And we do have our community where like-minded people actually can change the way fashion is consumed today. This is the team, Linda and I worked together for over seven years. Um, Linda has a strong focus on building brands that are engaging uh, consumers for a long time and actually building relationships with them. And my background is in social science and software engineering. So I'm taking care of the product development. And we do have a strong network of investors and angels from the sustainability sector, but also from fashion and logistics. And we're currently closing a convertible loan round. And also we're hiring if that's something you're interested in. So if this is something you're interested in, if you uh, want to talk more about non-ownership and making that the new normal, then you should definitely talk to me or my co-founder, Linda. We're looking especially for people who want to discuss without the data model that we've built. So everything you can contribute to quantifying impact and building these kinds of tools, just reach out, I would be happy to chat with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the great pitch, Tina. Um, also, as a reminder to our audience, we will have time for questions at the end. You can always post them in the chat. Um, and now let's welcome on stage Marta, 
co-founder of Freeman. Um, Freeman is also one of our portfolio company and uh, they created the internet for connected screens. Uh, Magda, when uh, you're ready, we are. Thank you, Ellen. Hi, um, my name is Magdalena and I'm co-founder of Freeman. Um, so when you want to reach your target locally, you are often confronted with a big spread outdoor, long planning time and expensive campaigns. And that's where Freeman comes into play. So we give brands and publishers access to their target group, meaning that Freeman provides the best attention for you and in exclusive locations. By that, we actually connect TVs in public spaces on our platform and make that to be a new global local channel, a new content platform. Advertisers can book screen time in, for example, hotels and co-working spaces and more. And by that, screen providers have a great entertainment channel and monetize, monetize their screens. For them, we actually turn TVs into signage infotainment and revenue. We are addressing a global $1 trillion advertising market in both B2C and also B2B. So right now, advertisers can book screen time on frame.io in whole Europe. For example, high-end hotels like Marriott, low-budget host hostels, co-working spaces like WeWork, or even malls. So just select the target groups and you want uh, you want to reach and you can display your advertisement campaign. We've de developed not only the cloud technology for streaming content on TV, but also a marketplace and a campaign planner. All this is a win-win situation. Screen providers can earn money, advertisers get efficiently access to their target group, and Freeman gets a commission. Our asset light approach enables us to grow rapidly and we scale 10 times faster as we use existing infrastructure. Uh, with our screen providers, we actually grow from local to global. Right now, we are already number one in co-working spaces and in the hospitality industry. Um, currently, we are connecting more real-time content, like, for example, news to our platform. And we want to accompany the mobile man and woman in their everyday life. And that's why we'll also provide our technology to the mobility industry and more. This is our core team. We have industry expertise. We all think outside the box. And therefore, we want to change the advertising world. We are thankful for a strong network of valuable investors and mentors. With Freeman, get the best attention. Thank you so much. Have a great, great evening. Um, feel free to connect um, and happy to chat with you. Thank you very much, much Magda. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't see your screen, but you did great. Uh, it was an awesome pitch. Um, so now let's welcome on stage Eugenia, CEO and co-founder at Emora. Emora is also one of our portfolio companies and it enables customers to manage end of life arrangements in a digital, transparent and personalized way. Welcome Eugenia. Hello, I'm happy to be here and to be part of this FEMA initiative today. Uh, can you please confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Perfect. So I'm happy to present you Emora today, the platform for the end of life. This is how all our lives might look like. We might marry, we might get children, but that's actually up to us. And there are two moments in life which are given for sure. And that's the birth and that's the end of our lives, the death. And if we experience a loss of a beloved person, that usually puts us under extreme organizational and emotional pressure. We need to organize the funeral. We need to make decisions. And at the same time, we need space to grieve. And actually, we are never perfectly prepared for this moment. And that leads to even more open questions. And Imora helps you during this difficult time. 
the Emora platform offers all end-of-life services in one place. So we enable customers to do proactive funeral planning financially and organizationally. Also, we help families to organize a funeral and a farewell ceremony in the event of an acute death. And we support those people who are grieving locally and digitally. And for this, we have built a German-wide selected partner network of funeral directors, musicians, florists, grieving speakers, and grieving therapists. Our current focus is to bring the funeral organization to the next level. With the Imora funeral experience, customers are able to purchase pre-arranged funeral packages. So with Imora, organizing a funeral becomes easy. We value transparent pricing. We still enable everyone to create a special and tailor-made farewell experience. And our customers enjoy a competent and empathetic service. In numbers, the market behind the funeral industry is huge. We have 1 million people passing away every year solely in Germany, and the market turnover of the funeral industry exceeds 5 billion euros. Per case, Imora earns around 750 euros, and we are looking into expanding the size of the ticket as well. We are already having paying customers, families in Berlin, Hamburg, and Frankfurt, which we help to organize funerals and farewell ceremonies. And also, we enjoy our growing community of over 40,000 people who are interacting with us. Here, our main channel, or one of the main channels, is our Emora own podcast called Ende Gut, where my co-founder and I are talking with different experts about end-of-life topics. And our mission here is to bring some light into the darkness and to open up the, top, the taboo topic of death. And that's us, the team behind Tomorrow. Victoria and I founded the company in uh, summer 2019. And in the meanwhile, we are a passionate and skilled team of seven people working every day towards our vision to revolute the whole end of life industry. We have all skills in house and are looking into scaling fast and make the Emora offering available German wide by the end of the year. So today I am here to get in touch with you and I'm super happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eugenia. Really great pitch. Um, now let us welcome Caroline, CEO and co-founder from the Combase. Uh, I see slides are being shared. Missing Caroline though? But maybe let me introduce to you to the Combase. So Combase is an online booking platform for unique well-being activities. Oh, Caroline, you're there. When you're ready, we are. Can you hear me? Yeah. And can you see my screen? Yes. OK, great. All right. Did you know? that more than half of all people experience stress and missing work-life balance. That is every second person in any work environment. And did you also know that recent studies by the World Health Organization state that in the next five years, stress management will be the number one cost factor for the entire health system, estimated 10 billion euro per year for Germany alone? I'm Caroline, one of the founders of the Calmbase. I envision a world where people feel empowered and not stressed, and companies with happy, loyal, and motivated employees. The Combase is a booking platform. We let stressed people and companies find and book activities to really get the work-life balance they desire. For example, a two-day company yoga and nature retreat in the Alps, or a one-week meditation and mindfulness workshop just outside of Berlin. Let me introduce to you the Combase and show you how it works. So if you're looking for a work-life balance and feeling stressed, the Combase recommends meditation and yoga activities combined with a nature setting. Easy selection, direct booking, and payment are just some of our features. The Combase is a well-being and health-focused solution 
tailored to help companies increase their employees' well-being and at the same time decrease sick days and overall cost involved. Personalization, innovation, direct booking and payment, as well as a software as a service solution for our operators adds real value to ensure retention and loyalty. Our marketplace platform typical model generates 15% commission and we have a software as a service subscription for operators. The market is trending and growing by 7.5% per year. The total available market in all of Europe is 190 billion euro. We started developing the product in January of this year and launched the MVP at the beginning of April. We achieved a top 10 placement for startup champs this summer and reported initial traction in the B2C sector. Since then, we have been working on cooperations in the corporate health management sector, and currently we have 100 operators with us. What's next? Pilot projects with several companies and a mobile application. We have a complementary team with a strong combination of unique skills. My co-founder, Alex, has a strong background, which is perfect for the structure, and he's also a certified mindfulness coach. Ben, our head of development, is responsible for all things technology to help drive innovation and growth. I'm a visionary, and scaling projects and building strong connections is what I'm really good at. Together, we're building the biggest Berlin-based mindfulness marketplace platform, shaping the future of people's well-being based on health science, data, and our core values. So we have a couple of requests. To all investors watching, if you like our idea and you want to know more about the round of 500,000 euro we're currently raising, please reach out. To all people feeling stressed and ready to change that, check out our website and get inspired. To operators in this sector, please register with us and help us market your activities. And to all managers, HR reps, managers, motivated to make your teams happier, healthier, and potentially attract more talent by offering a variety of health management solutions, please get in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caroline. The pitch training worked, eh? So really nice pitch, really good sales as well. Um, so now let us uh, welcome Marina from Frameride. Hi, yeah, are you there? Yes. Hi. Can you see my oh. slides? Not yet, but I will introduce you. Should be there. Now we now we can see. So Frameride oh. is a platform that makes all steps of image workflows communicate together. And there's a fun fact Marina shared with us. She has been cropped out from an image, so she really knows what she's talking about. So hi, my name is Marina. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Framerides. My background is in business and photography, and visual culture is close to my heart. Images are the first thing you see in news, advertising, and e-commerce. Making pictures look good requires putting a lot of effort into them, but most of the times, pictures end up looking like this. They're headless portraits or only chest areas picturing stories. I compare this feeling to the frustration if your text editing software would refuse to spell correctly. Photography used to be a process of carefully creating one final image. But in today's digital environment, one picture needs to fit to countless formats. Framerite solves this. We make images smart and capable of adjusting to all environments. We are currently working with media houses and news agencies in Germany and around Europe. And on top of that, there are endless applications with all digital platforms. Framerite combines human touch with artificial intelligence and creates a seamless augmented workflow. The editor UI can be used as a standalone application or directly in the user's browser. It, it also provides APIs for complex pipelines. Framerite integrates with every touch point in any system. It is the platform that makes all the steps of image workflows communicate together. Our monetization is based on creating and managing the crop information manually 
or with the frame right AI. For example, our customer in Finland was very happy, happy after we streamlined their processes. So editors could work 70% faster and they always knew that everything would look 100% correct. Their tech team even sent us this before and after picture with a thank you note. Their daily pain was suddenly gone with one simple integration. We wanted to build the best cropping, uh, image cropping AI in the world, one that could understand dynamics and composition. We made it happen with the help of a unique data set of 1 million manually cropped images from the German press agency. The result is a sophisticated model that outperforms all alternatives and evolves along with different styles and trends. Our $2 billion target market in the creative software industry consists of media, marketing and e-commerce professionals in companies that publish large amount of images. The long tail, including SMEs and hobbyists, makes the market considerably larger. My co-founder and our CTO Ilka has 20 years of experience in tech. We founded Framerite because we had seen the same problem from different sides of the table, and we knew that this issue has to be solved. We are raising a pre-seed round of 250,000 euros. The round will take us to 50k MRR within the next 12 months. Our vision is that Framerite will power every single image on the internet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. It's strange really not great. Have people around, so yeah. <laughs> really great uh, pitch, even though. And uh, with you, we can uh, showcase the quality of our VC for Female Founders initiative. So thank you so much for taking part in this event. Thank you um, so much. It has been so much fun, and the pitch training was so cool and everything. So. And the price is amazing. So. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Happy to hear. So now let's welcome the last pitch for today, Melanie and Leah from Braiu. Hi, thanks for having us. Can Hi. you see it? We can see it. So okay. Braiu makes bra shopping fun again. They are a femtech startup using data to rethink online bra shopping. If you're ready, let's go. Thank you very much, Paulina. As you've already said, we are Leah and Melanie from Braiu, and we are convinced that bra shopping should be fun and easy. Right now, bra shopping is a disaster. 70% of women dread bra shopping and would rather do something else. In fact, eight out of 10 women wear a bra that doesn't really fit every single day, which is really uncomfortable. To the men listening to our presentation right now, just imagine you're wearing shoes that don't really fit you don't really want that. And because bra shopping is so complicated, up to 75% of all online orders are returned, causing unnecessary costs and CO2 emissions. Brayu solves these issues and revolutionizes the 100 billion US dollar industry. Our goal is to empower women with the world's smartest boob and bra database. So let's talk about how we actually apply our technology. We've developed a short and entertaining fit quiz in which women tell us about their current favorite bra and their breasts. Our algorithm analyzes these answers and recommends a personal selection of bras from various labels. Our customers can then in the next step shop these recommendations immediately at our verified partner shops. This is an entertaining and new way to finally find a bra that fits. At the same time, we support online shops in reducing their high return rates and help them to get access to new customer groups. Our technology is built on three components. Understanding the customer needs and yeah, understanding how products fit and then match the best bra for everyone through data, algorithms, and machine learning. Humans, and especially laundry producers, still know too little about how the breast anatomy of women changes within their lifetime. The more data we collect, the better bra shopping becomes. Hence, we focus on gaining as many users as possible. We get a commission for every bra sale. This is currently at around 12% and we'll increase it in the short future to 25. 
Shortly, we will extend our product portfolio to include other underwear items and swimwear. In the long run, we can actually monetize our data insights. Rayu is bootstrapped and launched at the end of April. So far, we had more than 1,600 FitQuiz users, which we are happy about. And our customers are also happy, which is very cool and sounds, uh, and we find this in an NPS of 31. We are currently awarded with the Grüner Stipendium NRW, and what is um, even more cool, we um, yeah have an awesome, and uh, we reduce the turn the return rate by the quarter of I'm sorry, <laughs> by a quarter of the industry average. The team consists of Melanie, me, and Marco, and we have relevant skills that complement each other. We currently are uh, talking to investors to gain our pre-seed funding. And so by that, we can further develop our technology. In the third half of 2031, uh, 21, we want to introduce Brahu internationally. And our goal is to reach and crack the 1 million FitQuest users in 2023. So if you're an investor and looking for an awesome investment opportunity, please come and talk to us. If you're a woman, Check out our fit quiz. Please give us feedback and hopefully we can help you find a bra that really fits. And to all the others, let's unfuck bra shopping together. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Um, okay, so I think we can bring everyone on stage now and um, it's time for voting and questions. Um, so, uh, maybe let's start uh, with the voting. So, while we ask some questions, uh, you can all, all vote for the, for the best pitch. Um, if we could bring uh, the screen on stage so we can see um, the code. Um, let me see. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so, if you go to menti.com and type in the code 4620068, um, you can vote for your favorite pitch. Great. Thank you, Elena. So um, while we're uh, waiting for the, for the votes and seeing who won this really special prize, Elena just explained, um, let us take a look at the, let us take a look at the, the questions from the audience. So here I have a question from Luis Davi. How the Combase defined the pricing strategy? Is 10 euros too much or too little as a monthly subscription? Caroline. Is Caroline here? Can you hear me? Yeah. Very good question, Louise. Thanks for asking it. Um, yeah, so we have a commission-based model and the subscription base is currently at 10 euro per month. We have a basic premium and we're focused on an even higher um, subscription model. So there will be three stages. And I think once you show the operators the value um, that we're bringing to the table, um, it's not too much to ask if you have booking, payment, invoicing and everything else included in that service. I hope this answers the question. Thank you, Caroline. So here we have another question a question from Anastasia. Thank you uh, for, for the question, first of all. At Unown, are you planning to develop a user app? How will your user journey evolve and what future features will your product have to support leasing to gain more importance? Sure, thanks a lot for the question. Um, yeah, actually a little teaser. We are launching our user app in two weeks. Um, and the main focus will be um, the impact board I talked about. So we do have a lot of information about CO2 emissions, water usage, all of that. Um, and we also wanted to make the whole journey a bit smoother. So you will be able to have Ludmilla, which is our chat bot, and she will help you manage your leases, remind you when to send things back and have like the whole process of you know, getting away from emails when you're reminded by us that you still have something you need to give back to the community that all of that is uh, much easier on your smartphone. Great, Tina, thank you so much. Here we have another question from Luis. 
how does frame and metrics look like? What are the metrics you're focusing to grow from where you are? Great, thank you for the question. Um, so metrics in terms of growing, we have our team providers, for example, one uh, hotel um, in, in Berlin, for example, we're piloting with him and then we're growing from Germany to Europe. That has been the case several times already. Um, yeah, that's in terms of um, how we grow. Great, thank you, Magda. Um, so I would have a question to uh, Marina from Framerite because she was so excited about the price. Who you, would you be taking to the driving experience? There are four um, places actually. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the place for my team. So <laughs> we all deserve that to have some fun. <laughs> Fair enough. Leah, Melanie, what about you? Well, it would be the first and great opportunity um, yeah, to drive uh, on the Hockenheim ring. <laughs> great. So um, I don't know, how far are we with the voting, Elena? Um, we are at 112 people. Um, I actually think if we have uh, maybe one more question, we will have time for that. Um, otherwise, uh, we can discover our winner. Thank you, whoever posted this. Uh, so what's the revenue model of Imara? Yeah, very good question. Um, so when we started our operations in April, we started as a classical um, referral agency by charging a commission of 15% by referring the customer to the selected service provider. Now with the Imara funeral experiences, we are looking into selling package deals where we basically can uh, rise our margin on that. Um, that is on the funeral organization part. Um, for contents like uh, our podcast, we are looking into um, operations with, um, um, with media houses uh, where we also have additional revenue streams. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, this, I just saw there's one more question. What are the main challenges from Emora nowadays? Yeah, um, since August, we are heavily investing into customer acquisition and we are getting more and more customers. So now our big challenge is to really streamline the operation, to scale up the team a little bit that we can basically cover all of Germany and also to teach customers about the growing transparency um, in the funeral space we are offering by providing digital offers. Thank you so much. Um, so maybe we could talk a bit uh, with the external startups today that we're pitching first time at Pitch Tuesday. Um, oh, another one. Oh, great pitches and brilliant startups. So this is actually a comment that is um, uh, that is being shown a lot. Here. So this is feedback from the audience to cheer you up. Um, but how was your experience with the pitch training? Maybe Caroline? It was wonderful. Ole did an amazing job pointing us in the right direction, and I hope it showed. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Melanie, Lea, how was it for you? We had a really good experience with Ola as well. We really enjoyed it, and it was fascinating to see how much you can improve in just 60 minutes. Cool. Marina? It was really good, and it was nice to have that thing also in the autumn. You, you know, refresh the pitch a little bit, and uh, yeah, it was really good. And also, we went through about like um, he showed his uh, equipment and so on. So I need to kind of also get this like lighting stuff and 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 this like under control for virtual meetings and stuff like that. So cool. So now, as we have so much positive energy right now in the room, shall we take a look at the voting? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> tell you we have 158 votes um, okay so we are ready let's see who the winner is oh congratulations Freeman <laughs> great job <laughs> thanks a lot I mean it wasn't on purpose that my slides didn't Thank you for a lot for the organization and for the hosting. Um, also get to know you, um, the external startups. Um, 
Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Maybe, uh, Elena, you want to pitch again the, the prize that uh, Framing is going to get? Absolutely. So um, it's a Porsche driving experience uh, at Hockenheim and the Porsche Experience Center in Hockenheim. Um, so um, you will be able to choose about three people who have this experience with you. And just so you know, Pauline and I said we are totally available for that. <laughs> And um, so you will be able to choose two Porsche models and you will be able to try them um, there. And you will also have an instructor who will show you how to get the most out of the experience. So I'm very excited. I don't know if Sören is coming back to the stream again. Yes. I can if you want me to. <laughs> um, but I think we're ending or at the end of this uh, great pitch competition. Thank you so much to all of you for, for joining and pitching. Um, we're going to kick out now to leave the open stage for our panel discussion. So thanks again so much for, for joining. Thanks for having us. Great, great job, well, everyone. Thank you so much thank and you. congratulations. <laughs>
bit of a background what APX is. I hope, of course, everyone knows, but for all of you who don't know, we are a startup investor based in Berlin and in joint venture of Axel Springer and Porsche. So both um, shareholders own the company 50% and we invest in really early stage companies, always 50%, 50,000 euros in cash and a tailor-made program and network. And after around 100 days um, that we really work on with the companies very closely, we make a decision if we invest more money and also help um, the companies to find more investors um, because 50,000 euros is fine, but they only bring you so far. And that's also where me, myself and my team, we are really active in to really find um, these investors, to connect these investors to the companies and just be a partner for the company until a hopefully successful exit in the end. And yeah, just to answer the questions, um, the question what brought me here, so I've actually been working with Axel Springer now for 12 years. So I'm a bit of a corporate um, yeah, corporate person in the past. So I started there in um, corporate controlling, accounting. Then um, I moved into an innovation apartment we founded in 2012, so a while ago, where we actually tried to um, found our own companies within the corporate. And didn't work out so well. And when we closed this um, um, unit, I joined Axel Springer Plug and Play. This was our first accelerator. And in 2018, I um, joined and built um, APX together with um, our managing directors. And yeah, what brought me here, I would say, is really um, that I just was really open and grabbed opportunities when they presented themselves, um, even within the corporate, that's possible. And yeah, really happy I made it here. Cool, Johannes, you want to go next? You are on mute, Johannes. Oh, all no. right. Be yes. be be beginners, beginners' mistakes, even even after uh, months of pandemia and online meetings, I'm still not um, keen on unmuting myself. Well, thank you so much for having me, Moa. Um, it's a great pleasure. I run this newspaper. I hope everybody can see that. So a classical good old print product that has been here for multiple decades was just founded um, um, uh, right after the war. Um, so very uh, classical product. And uh, uh, but of course, the best newspaper is always up to date and always deals with everything that's going on. So um, we have um, a business section that deals a lot with startups, deals a lot with uh, with tech and um, Therefore, I thought um, it would be um, a great collaboration um, uh, between us. And um, I have been running the newspaper for one and a half years now, so pretty new as an uh, pretty new in my job as editor in chief. Um, ironically, you asked uh, what brought me here. Ironically, it uh, was the decision to uh, drop out of my uh, journalistic career for a while. I had been a reporter already for ten years at Süddeutsche Zeitung, based in Munich and then decided uh, uh, to take a completely different job. So I ran the office of the CEO at Axel Springer for two years, a little bit more than two years. And after that, I came back into journalism and um, I'm very happy now that uh, I can do this beautiful newspaper. Welt am Sonntag is just one out of many products that we produce within Welt Group. We also have a TV station. We have a daily paper. And uh, we have a website that goes quite strong. So, um, yeah, we have a whole product range here and um, a lot of uh, discussions and debates every day, which topic goes into which channel. So doing a newspaper today um, is somewhat close to product management and uh, at least much more than it used to be in the good old days. Super exciting. Thank you, Johannes, for sharing. Patricia. Hello. <laughs> so my name is uh, Patricia Rennert. Um, I work with uh, Porsche Digital. At Porsche Digital, we do have um, three strategic um, approaches. We um, investigate customer solutions for new business opportunities. Uh, we use deep tech uh, for industry processes to bring value to the core company processes, for example, Porsche. Um, and I'm also uh, quite proud to uh, say that I'm uh, responsible for this area. And then we have a third approach within Porsche Digital um, where we connect with the digital ecosystem um, that's also based out of Berlin um, in our company builder, Forward 31. 
Um, yes, what brought me here, um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, I used to be with Porsche. I always say I'm a bit of a Porsche, Porsche child. I've joined Porsche ever since my internship uh, happened working with the company uh, since 2005. Um, I have always been in the resort, uh, as we say, production. Um, and I'm a bit proud of, to, to say that I was the first female to be in charge of a production line. Um, so I did have, um, I think about 1200 workers um, sort of working with me to build the then brand new McCann and Panamera in Leipzig. Um, so that was a really tough, tough job. Um, and what brought me here, um, I guess uh, a lot of uh, fearlessness and, and, and courage to actually leave the company uh, and join the world of digital transformation with uh, TLGG uh, here based out of Kreuzberg in Berlin, some of you may know them, um, but then rejoined uh, Porsche Digital as I saw that we uh, did move on a little bit and became a bit more uh, open to, to digital things and, and new technologies. And um, yes, I'm, I'm here and now building uh, AI type software. So that's what I do. Super exciting. Tina. Yeah, hi. I'm Tina. I'm the co-founder of Leasing uh, for Good and our consumer brand Unown. Um, we provide a platform for access over ownership for lifestyle goods. I actually do have a background in computer science and social science. And before I started this own venture, I worked in IT consulting for over seven years in the field of automotive. Um, and I always had the feeling of I need to start my own venture at some point. Um, I guess the reason was just taking on that challenge for one, but also like I'm always looking for just having the opportunity to build great teams, build great products and just building a culture that just is like based on what I envision a great company to be. And I never felt I could that do in a context where I was not fully in charge. So um, that was the reason why I started uh, my own venture. And then, I mean, I've worked with Linda, my co-founder for, for the whole seven years in different contexts. And it was just a logical thing that we just start something together. And here I am. Super cool. It seems like a lot of kind of like to be open to new opportunities brought all of you to where you are at the moment. And I think it's very exciting. So just kind of like to set the stage, we're going to discuss on different topics today. Uh, maybe if I'll sum it up, it's going to be very main three. First of all, we'll ask our uh, panelists to share their personal experience from in in, from senior leadership position in different fields and industries. Um, we would like to, um, to understand what we can all do in order to tackle a female representations. And of course, we would be very happy to hear your questions. So feel free to ask anything you want in the chat. Uh, after our panel discussion, we will leave some time for your questions and your comments. Um, so really feel free to have the discussion and ask us any question that you want. Um, so that was kind of like just a, a, a brief to our discussion. So maybe let's start uh, with also a question to all of our panelists. Um, so we, you are all coming from different industries and we would like to know what's the status quo of female representation, especially in leadership position uh, in your different uh, industries. Um, so maybe uh, Patricia, let's start uh, with you, the automotive. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, automotive is still very traditionally um, male dominated, uh, very hardware um, focused, very engineer driven group. So yes, of course, there is um, still little female leadership, although we see that there is more female leadership coming um, and building up. And um, especially I think there is a lot more openness toward um, not only female leadership, but also uh, the encouragement of um, working models uh, that support family, um, family life. Um, but yes, so of course, there's uh, still lots, lots to do. Mm -hmm. Melanie, um, how is it in the VC slash finance world? Yeah, um, that's def definitely a topic. Um, I unfortunately cannot say, oh, it's fine. We have 50-50% representation everywhere. Um, I mean, as you can read these days, um, all, of, all over the media, only 20% of um, companies are actually founded by 
by women, but also in leadership positions within these companies, like not only the founding team, also the C-level, but also the on the other side, the investors, we can see that we don't have a 50 or even close to 50% percent, um, percentage of women yet. Um, another um, fact is maybe um, it's not only about who builds companies and who invests in it. It's also about the products we have to have a look at. And there's a big um, part of um, products, we call it femtech, like everything that's targeted um, to women, especially as a target group, where we just now in the last, I would say, year or two, especially in Germany, see actually more and more happening. And I would also say that's really positive. So from, from my point of view, the status quo is, um, that we now are really at a point where we start to talk about it. A couple of years ago, I've been doing this now for five years, it wasn't even a topic. No one actually addressed it yet, that this could be an issue that we don't have enough women founding companies or in the investor on the investor side. And I'm really happy that this conversation is now taking place. And we have really strong women in this industry who take a stand and who are role models to really um, talk about it. and also to be really mindful in our industry in, in every industry it's not only about gender diversity and we're just starting with this topic at the moment but there's much more diversity to discuss and mm -hmm. yeah i think it's a really exciting time now to do this definitely tina as a founder <laughs> yeah i mean for me the startup scene um i always looked at the numbers and you know all of that before you go into it. And you you always think it can't be that dramatic. And as soon as you're in that game, you feel, oh my God, it's even worse than I thought. Um, so from what I experienced, it's really good that we start talking about it. So that makes me actually very happy. But also I do experience a lot of, um, I would say weird discussions going on online where you have that con that there's a kind of a bias that the VC world is in a way more neutral because they look at business models, they look at numbers, you know, they don't look at the founders. They just like, if the model works, they just want to earn money. You have that kind of um, discussion sometimes going on and it doesn't really feel like you do have the same um, choices. And I think this is something, um, we're gonna talk more and more in the in the panel about what the reasons for for these kind of um, you know misrepresentation um, is and what we can do about it. But I feel it's a very the the status is traumatic. I would say, Johannes, how do you sit also in the media industry? Well, it's tricky, uh, just like in uh, many other industries. Maybe not as bad, if I may say so. Um, uh, like in the um, heavy industries or um, um, in finance, but uh, still tricky. I have looked up before we started this uh, talk, the figures for um, female representation in leadership positions in the eight um, biggest and uh, best known federal level uh, print publications. That would be Stern, Spiegel, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Zeit, Bild, of course, Welt, um, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and Focus. And I just want to give you a little uh, rundown. So Stern, I, this is actually figures from June 2019, so fairly new, the newest uh, uh, available. Stern is above 50% at 52.2, um, followed by Spiegel 38.9, Süddeutsche 32.6, female uh, or women in uh, leadership uh, positions, Zeit 28.4, Bild. 26.2 Welt, a poor 18.8 where I work, and uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung even below with 17.5, while Focus only achieves uh, achieves um, 11.8. Now I have to say these are figures from a pro um, quota group, like a lobby group, and there are some inaccuracies. I can also say that it's not that bad at Welt, but it is bad. And um, I can also say it's better if you look to digital publications. These are traditional print public publications. However, all, all you know, it doesn't change a lot. It's still bad. Um, female leadership is greatly underrepresented in traditional German media. And just like Melanie uh, mentioned, we have to look at the products too, right? I mean, we're creating the news. We are, we are um, uh, creating the narratives that are perceived by many and uh, women are 50 percent of uh, the population so uh, the narratives and uh, what we all listen and talk about should also be created 
um, um, uh, roughly by 50% women. And yeah, that's the current status right now. There's work to do. However, we're doing probably a little bit better than other um, um, industries due to the fact that we have these um, um, lobby groups and also maybe due to the fact that uh, journalists might differ in their political attitude and political opinion from other fields of work and might therefore be a little bit more progressive, but that's up for discussion. Yeah, we're going to talk about it later. So please leave some questions for me to ask you. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much for, I would say, the detailed information. I think actually the numbers, it looks, it's very, I'm very surprised because it's actually pretty nice. I think that we can, the other industries maybe should kind of like take a look on what's going on in the media industry and maybe learn from you. Um, Patricia, going back to you. Um, not only that you're working, in, I would say, in an automotive world that is kind of like, you know, when defined as very, I would say, male dominated and very, I would say, conservative, uh, you are also working in the production area, uh, mm -hmm. which yes, is, I would, say, I would say, even a, a little bit more um, uh, conservative and male dominated. Mm -hmm. And actually, my question is, what's your experience? Um, how did you make it to where you are now? And maybe also, I mean, we spoke about it a little bit. Um, I assume that in many cases you are the only woman sitting next to the table. Um, if you have, maybe it's it's not relevant for you, maybe you don't feel it, but if, how is your experience? Maybe you can share with us best practices or actually what's working for you. It's a relatively big question, so we'll try to keep it short <laughs> as much as possible. Okay. Yeah. But yes. Uh, so um, yes, it's, uh, I, I'm trying to uh, to dissect that uh, a little bit. Uh, so yes, um, I mean, looking back on, on on my career, I mean, saying that at not even 40, I mean, like, I'm not looking back. I'm just like re reviewing it. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's um, it, it much lies in in like who I am and how I was raised. I, I guess I'm a bit um, uh, very, I mean, I, I started mechanical engineering, so it didn't really start when I entered the workforce. It ended, it, it started way before that. So when I entered my, my study group, I was the, the first and only female um, in that group. Um, and there was really low females um, that I interacted with. So. I guess one of the the things that really truly is part of me is is um, not to sound arrogant, but it's a it's a it's a high level of, of self confidence, knowing what I can, um, trusting my abilities, um, and another one is is that I think um, is is really valuable is to be authentic and staying true to yourself. So of course I had to make it in the in the male dominated area and. Um, I never wanted to to be like the other men were. I always um, fought to to find my own way. Um, and even when I started the the position in in Leipzig to head the the assembly line, um, I didn't try to be like the toughest assembly line manager that there is. I mean, of course, I I knew I could do that. I'm not like the the 55 year old. Um, standing in the line every single day that's not me i mean um i do like my weekends uh i have a three-year-old daughter now of course i i'm i'm consumed by a lot of things so um and of course i lead differently and um i did have a mentor um there and uh he was actually ceo of the the, the leipzig plant and he um he said um i i trust you can do this uh i i believe in you i have the faith in you but uh you can always come to questions with me but you need to come um and ask and ask for help so that was one one uh good lesson to take away is is to actually ask for help if, if you need it and um prior to asking questions and, and coming to your or going to your mentor asking questions you have to reflect um and that is just really uh, listening to to what is going on with you, assessing the situation, um, taking yourself out of the equation. Um, so I guess um, that is also, to me, is leading by questions or just asking a lot of questions, trying to understand situations, trying to understand people. So um, I guess that's really um, what, uh, I don't know, like, 
what's really important to me is to asking questions. And even if you're the only female at the table, yes, you ask questions. And uh, it does feel to me, it's, it's more of a feeling that I see more and more females uh, popping up at, at the tables or as we are here in Berlin in our team, we are 50% women. Um, and not only that, <clears throat> it's also a very diverse um, background. And I enjoy that every single uh, day that the situation in other parts is slowly changing. But um, have I been confronted with awkward situations? Yes. Um, what do I do? I try to not let the let them get the better of me and stay authentic to to who I am. Thank you very much for the honesty and transparency. <laughs> Johannes, back to you. Um, not only you represent, a, I would say, a large media outlet, you are also a journalist, meaning you had a very, I would say, close observation on the economical situation and the political climate. And I mean, I guess that female representation or underrepresentation, it's not a new topic and it's widely discussed. And I think we are in the kind of like in the middle of a process that we are actually more and more discuss discussing about it. But actually, I have a question also from kind of like your journalist perspective. Is it true, the process that we're now seeing, that it's more discussed, that there is some wind of changes, or it's kind of like a bubble or the picture that we choose to see? Mm, that's an interesting question. I mean, yeah, it depends where you get your news from, um, where you get your news from. Some uh, people might constantly um, uh, work on that topic and uh, debate and discuss that topic. However, does that really change a lot? Um, I thought a little bit, or if I if I think about politics, right? The problem I see with politics is not anymore that women per se cannot achieve top positions. That would be ridiculous to say after the country has been ruled by a female chancellor for many years, after the head of the European Commission um, is, uh, is a, a woman. Um, but... Uh, I see more a problem with sustainability of this um, achievement and that success. For example, if you look at the party of the chancellor, uh, CDU, um, you know, of course, it's a party of strong women. I just mentioned two, of course, Angela Merkel, um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen now in Brussels and Annegret Kamp karrenbauer party head. Yeah, But two of them will resign next year. They have officially announced that maybe with AKK, we, we will see, but uh, definitely um, um, uh, Merkel will not be chancellor anymore. And what happens? Uh, the people that follow and the candidates that follow so far are four men. So this is a lack of sustainability, right? You can make it as a woman to the top, no, no question, no doubt. But usually when a man gets kicked out, he's um, replaced by another man when a woman gets kicked out, which I think, by the way, is fair because politics is tough and women should be uh, kicked out just like men get kicked out. That's politics. But when the woman get, gets kicked out, she's way too often followed by a man. And that is the problem. We also, another example would be FDP, the libertarian, if you want to, party of Germany, you know, they had a strong woman as a general secretary. The party had fired her two weeks ago. Another woman resigned uh, due to internal trouble. And suddenly the whole party is becoming a boys club. If you turn the picture and you think about uh, two men resigning or getting kicked out from a party, would then the party turn into a girls club? Not at all. Yeah. So sustainability is the big issue here. Um, not necessarily glass ceilings. If you look at the economy, it's a little bit um, different, uh, and I'd say it's worse, because especially if you look at executive boards, being a journalist, I looked up the numbers uh, once again, yeah, um, there are only 14.4% of women in executive boards throughout DAX 30, which is the 30 uh, strongest German companies. And what is really disappointing is that, for example, even very fancy, and if you want so woke companies like Adidas, join DAX with uh, zero women in the board. Um, all other companies that have zero women in the board are more uh, from the heavy industries field, from the tech field or the chemistry field, which is, I think, a topic on its own, why it's so hard in this area um, to have women in leadership positions such as Bayer, E.ON, Siemens, MTU, Heidelberg, Cement, Infineon, all of them, zero women in the board. The highest amount of women in the board, um, which is only a total of two, by the way, 
you can see in automotive uh, with Daimler and in telecommunications and insurance with Allianz and Deutsche Telekom. And if you look at percentages, uh, sorry to say that sort of, the highest percentage ever was achieved by Wirecard, um, a highly corrupt company that just broke together. So not really a success story here with 33% if you want to talk percentage. Um, in the board followed then by Daimler and Deutsche Telekom. Okay, to sum it up, um, I think there's work to do. There's a lot of work to do. And I do think that there is a bubble, especially more, I don't know which bubble is your bubble, but probably in the tech Vogue Berlin scene, there is a constant talk about female leadership, but that bubble is not really influential when it comes to the real industries, when it comes to real politics. And therefore, I think it's a misrepresentation um, that the topic female leadership is taken serious enough. I don't think that is um, really the case. However, last uh, words uh, on that topic, we have seen significant progress. If you look into these uh, figures from uh, the same figures five years ago, it looked much, much, much worse. So, so there, is, there, there is a progress. There is progress. That's the good news I have. If I look also into my own industry, I gave you the uh, figures yeah. earlier five years ago. No, no um, uh, media outlet was even close to 50. Yeah. And now we have already the first ones jumping over 50. So same is true for the economy as a whole. There is progress, but it's by far not good enough. Thank you for actually this fascinating, I would say, kind of like overview. And um, just maybe a quick note. Today I was... Um... Uh, the CEO of Axel Springer, Matthias Dufner, said something very interesting. said, when I uh, became a CEO, I didn't know for how long I'm going to stay. Um, but And I don't know uh, who is she, who is, what is the name of the woman that actually is going to replace me. And I think maybe it's not only like how we keep it sustainable. It's also that words can become an action. But we will talk about it later because we have so many topics to discuss. Um, Melanie. Uh, I already mentioned, uh, I think that you are in a very, uh, I would say, um, interesting junction. Because from one hand, uh, you have uh, the perspective of the VC world. And from the other hand, you're also working with uh, many, many startups. And we all, um, I don't know if you know, that, but there is a, the female uh, founder monitor showed that women have significantly less access to venture capital. And we all know that startups need the money to grow. From your experience, what could be the reason for that? And actually, how we can tackle this topic? Yeah, that is also a really big question. Um, I try to make it make it short. Um, so my my opinion is actually two parts. So the first is if you look at these numbers, and I would really everyone who's interested really um, advised to look at these female founder monitors, really interesting numbers. But you can see that only 20% of all startups in Germany are actually founded by female founders, by women. Um, and that's, I would say, is the first issue we have. What, why is it that um, women don't feel like they can or they want to found a company? And there are a lot of reasons, I think, because we're talking about venture capital here, I won't get too much into detail, but it's all these reasons about women not being so much working in these mint or studying these mint um, topics and um, the way we raise our girls or young women what can they do what can they achieve and um, the way we divide parenting um, so that um, women maybe don't have the time to actually build a company because they always have to juggle um, kids or care and with their jobs and so on but it's really it's really one big issue that only 20 percent of the, um, the companies so at the really beginning are actually founded by women However, if you then look at the companies that are actually there, then you can also see in these figures that female teams um, have it, it's much harder for them to actually get venture capital. Um, so it's not only the fact that there are less of them, it's, it's also really proven that the ones trying then to get venture capital, they're not as successful. And to understand why, um, first of all, it's also really important to know there are different ways, of course, of financing a company. It doesn't have to be always venture capital. Venture capital is this really for really fast growing um, companies that want to gain a lot of big market share, take a lot of risk um, because investors want to invest this money. They know there's a high risk involved, but they also want to have a high return. So they need to see this hyper growth in a company. And Again, there's one just reason that it's actually these kind of companies, at least so far, 
are more often founded by men. So um, also, if you look again in these in these numbers, you can see that um, not all of them, of course, but most women are more looking um, um, at companies that are more aiming for profitability or building a more sustainable kind of organization. So um, I would say more like what we would say as a typical German Mittelstand, like really a company that is, I would say, healthy and can grow organically. And these factors like hyper growth, gaining quick market share, this is something that's more um, pursued by, female, by male founders. Of course, that's not true for all founders, but it's just like if we talk about numbers here. However, still, um, these women who built these hyper growth companies and are now going out to get venture capital still are not as successful as men. And here, um, it, something comes into place, what Tina mentioned before, um, it's this bias from investors we are talking about. Of course, it's really hard to prove that, but what you can hear again in, from founders or read in studies is that um, investors judge women just differently. So it's often, um, it's typically that women are asked more for risk in their companies, men are more asked for opportunities. It's just a bit different way of approaching them. And also, if you look at the traditional um, venture capital company, it's often there's hardly any women on the in the team. And also, there's if you look at other diversity factors, it's really often a certain age group, a certain background, and um, a certain um, even cultural background. So it's really um, really hard if you come there as a female founder um, with maybe even a femtech product or so product targeting um, females um, to to get here to really um, find out um, of find your way through this and then actually convince investors of course it's not impossible but it's it's just sometimes just harder because there is this kind of bias for investors um, and I think because um, also something you mentioned before, Tina, that um, they said, well, this shouldn't be the fact because um, we just look at numbers and grow and the team doesn't is not so important. But that's actually not true because if you look at really early companies up into Series A, sometimes Series B, so the first financing rounds, the team is still a really, really important um, decision factor for every VC. So you can have the best numbers. They still look at the team. They still want to see, do I really think this team can make it? Do I really believe they do what they promise? So, and then it's, it's really on starting an evaluation starts on a really personal level. And then these biases can kick in. I'm not saying that every VC, I've got no, but like um, on the product space, that's what's happening. And yeah, what can you do? Um, what we do um, as APX, at least, we first of all, to start at the beginning of the funnel, we try to encourage. So we offer um, formats, we offer office hour, hours for um, aspiring founders to actually encourage them to to found a company, put our female founders on stage, showing them it's possible. There are role models you can look up to, to really just encourage more women to found their own company. Then we did um, the initiative you more mentioned, your initiative we did to together with um, Joint Capital and the VC office hours where we really brought together a lot of MVCs and offered office hours just for female and mixed teams. So to give women access to, to capital because that's, as you said, it's the most important. They need to get access to the money to actually um, build these companies. And another one, we do as APX, and I would really hope every VC is doing, um, as every venture capitalist, is to really address your own biases, to really check, do you have a diverse team? Do you have a diverse se um, selection team? Um, have a really open discussion maybe within your team. Do we have a bias? How can we tackle it? I think this is really important to make sure that selection becomes much more much more fair. And it's not only because it's the right thing to do, it's also in terms of money the right thing to do because diverse um, teams are also really successful. So it's not only something to do to save the world, it's really something also to do to do what we yeah, want to do to make some money. Thank you, Melanie. And actually, I would like to lop in uh, Tina here. Tina, you together with Linda, a co founded oh. and own, we heard you before, a leasing platform for, for sustainable fashion. And I guess that you, um, I will maybe kind of like ask you to maybe comment on what uh, Melanie just mentioned the lack of access to uh, venture capital money or to, uh, to funding in general. Maybe if you can kind of like also share with us very briefly your insights and actually how, what you are doing to overcome these barriers. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so first, I can confirm a lot of the things Melanie um, was talking about, right? So for me, also, it started just to make it maybe just my personal story, because every story of every female found is different. But mine was I started really late founding my first own company at 32, which like a lot of founders start earlier. And one of the reason was just to not be sure if that makes sense for me. And actually, um, I had a lot of like friends and family they comment on that well are you sure it's super risky mm, and do you really you know if you're not coming from a background where just like entrepreneurship is just normal and you just do it you have that first barrier you need to kind of overcome and just you know get out there and start so i think like all of the initiatives that give you access to information on how to actually approach it that makes total sense and then as soon um, as Linda and I were in the game, I would say we do constantly have um, talks with, especially with VCs, where we have to tackle prevention questions. So we never get promotion questions. So people will ask us, how can you retain the users you currently have, instead of asking us how many users you gain in the next two years? So um, we actually, and this is one of the things we do, is something that's in our space where we can have control, is to train ourselves to just turn every prevention question into a promotion question. Well, yes, that it's an asset. And now you make a, looking back, how did you grow so far into a vision question? You know, like playing that game and training yourself on that aspect is something that you as a founder can do and you can train yourself. And we think it actually helps in that discussions and i think there's also studies i have to look that up but actually your um probability of raising money actually increases if you're like really good and playing that game um also like training yourself that you have to do that it's kind of sad <laughs> um because it just reflects that you have that bias and actually it's true for female vcs as well so it doesn't really change the game if you have female investment analysts on the other side they still will tend to ask um prevention question to female founders. So you always have to talk about risk and all of that. And obviously your business case comes across very differently. So it is a, it is about narrative and how you kind of frame your story. And this is something where you, um, where you really have to train yourself. So for us, that is still a challenge every day to change the way we tell our, our, our startup story. Patricia is. I think she wants to comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, I can. I can only um, highlight what you're saying. I mean, um, being where I am today, or or having been through uh, like different stages, I can only highlight that it's important to to actually play the game and know the rules, and also uh sort of play by the rules, but maybe bend them a little bit here and there. Of course, I mean, it's um it, a lot of corporate politics um, that are also have been involved in, in, in my personal um, career development, of course. And um, can you change the game? Maybe. Can you change the game a little bit easier when you're in a senior position? Yes. But do you, what do you do to get there? You cannot like um, say we're all going to be uh, different, but um, of course for, for my employees, I also would like to, to offer them, the, the benefit of what I have gone through um, and um, be a little bit more um, helpful uh, here and there. And I think this is where, where it comes in, where we can all be part of the change. And, and not only, uh, I said before, women or females, but also families. I mean, um, having gone through a pandemic and, and knowing what home office is all, is all about with two people working home with a three-year-old, I mean, um, we all need to um, look at the opportunities we can offer to to help sustainable leadership. If that's female um, families, uh, we have a lot of different backgrounds here. We 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 are a very diverse team, and and it's really um, well looking how can the the individual perform best and uh, bring its 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 best value. And and it's also true in a corporate corporate sort of environment and uh, not only in the startup. So uh, I think it's important what I what I wanted to highlight and I found myself in what you're saying, Tina, is is sort of know the game, play the game, but here and yeah. there extend it a bit to to your own um, to your own drive. 
Yeah, exactly. And just like, just like voicing that you realize that something is going on. So we actually like, we started to just point some VCs to their portfolios and just saying, well, you have a lot of guys founding a lot of great companies. Don't you think you need some finger founders in your portfolio? Yeah. And just like making not, you know, not like, well, please change it now, but just like see that you're realizing that there's a problem and just talking yeah. about it. Yeah. And you don't have to be too serious about it, but it's a discussion we should all have. Absolutely. So I'm checking the time. And actually, I thought that we have a little bit more time, but we have five minutes. So I would like, since Patricia and Tinia, you uh, both mentioned really, really good tips or best practices or actually how to make this lemon a lemonade. I would also <coughs> like to ask you, um, Johannes and Melanie and Patricia and Tina, in maybe one sentence the best advice you would given to yourself that you can give to others um something that in maybe also from your perspective from your industries if someone want to kind of like go into the automotive world to the bvc world to be an entrepreneur to the media industry what is the best advice that you can give her and they one sentence <laughs> <laughs> I can start if you, you, you have to moderate more. No, I start. I Go think ahead. like me just in the startup world, just find your perfect co-founder. Like Linda is my work wife and um, without her, I couldn't do it. So find your, like the person you want to have that journey with. Johannes? Well, it's a, it's a no-brainer, but in one sentence, you've you got to be dedicated to the values of journalism. If you really want to dig deep and find out the truth, then go for it, work hard, stay focused. There are a lot of hurdles since the industry is in the transformation, but no big secret, but these are the keys uh, to become a successful journalist. Melanie. Um so my advice would be more from a senior leadership position um, saying, just say what you want. Don't wait and someone will know or will ask you, um, just really say what you want. Maybe it doesn't happen right away, but if you don't say it, it will never happen. So I think this is something I learned personally and would always um, yeah, advise to others. Patricia. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I have actually uh, three things. Um, one is a bit more personal, it's a stay authentic. Uh, the second is like know how to play all melodies. Like uh, the German saying is the uh, gesamte Klaviatur. I don't know what that saying is in English. Um, and the other, uh, the third one is maybe from more of a corporate um, perspective. Find something where you can make yourself visible. Cool. We have time for I would say maybe two questions, and we already have a question here. Um, I will read it to you for some reason. I can't put it on the screen, but never mind. Um, could you share what helped you personally to take more risks? Here it is on the screen. Um, maybe uh, start with you, Tina, because uh, you kind of like the entrepreneur journey. What helped you to take this risk or this opportunity? I mean, at the end, I think it was nothing that specifically helped me. I just, I couldn't stay in like the old ways of working in the job I had. So it was kind of my getaway ticket. Um, and then the other thing, I think Patricia mentioned it earlier that if you have people who along your career tell you that you can actually do that, like why are you even questioning yourself? And I was lucky in that way too, that I had a lot of mentors who just like, they never, they were just like, yeah, of course. I mean, they did not even have any questions that they just do it. And if you have like people who tell you that all the time, it makes it much easier. I mean, that's not something you can actually, either you have it or not, but um, you can, I guess there's some, there's some ways also to just make sure you're confident yourself, but you just, I, I don't know, you just have to do it. I think most of us, we're in a privileged position that, I mean, what can happen? You go back to the job you had before. I don't know. Like mm -hmm. that was always my thinking. Like I just go back. So I would happens. take the second part of the question and uh, how we can, or how we can support more women in your industry. Maybe uh, you, Johannes, from the media journalism uh, perspective, how do you think, or yeah, how do you think the industry can support more women? 
Well, I mean, one thing is obvious through hiring. Um, make sure that you are absolutely unbiased in hiring and uh, that you get rid of old structures and uh, also of old narratives. If you have them in your head, I think, um, yeah, there have been generations that just uh, needed to be convinced that women are fit for every job a man can do. If this still exists in your company, it's horrible. You need to get rid of it. Um, um, hiring is a key um, um, play, is a key element, of course. And then, what I feel really important, um, or, or what I think is really important, first of all, there need to be role models. And uh, maybe this is strange to say, especially as a man, but I don't think these role models necessarily need to be women, even though it should be role models for women. It just uh, needs uh, people who are willing to um, lead that debate and to bring that debate up and to um, continue to discuss it so that everybody knows uh, this is a work atmosphere in which um, uh, 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 women are wanted to have a, a great career. And um, the other thing is, and it's an unpleasant truth, but um, if there is discrimination happening, which is the root of all evil and does not only take place with regards to women, but with all kinds of diversity, you have to speak out. And um, I, I know it's unpleasant, but I just hope that every company by now has a, a, an atmosphere in which that is possible and in which that is encouraged. And um, uh, I hear way too often stories, luckily, I may say that not really from Axel Springer, but from uh, people around the industry that are like, I didn't dare to say anything because. And um, I hope that that ends. And if you are in a senior um, leadership position, it is your um, it is your duty to end that environment uh, immediately. Thank you very much. I'm going to kind of like say, Take two more minutes from your time because I want also Patricia and Melanie, if you can maybe say in like two sentences your point of view about it, of what you, they actually can industry can do. Um, I think um, <laughs> I was actually prepared to add some more on a personal level. Uh, I think one one piece of advice, uh, if I may, uh, that would be um, not stress about the possible outcomes too much in the beginning, but find solution when actually the problems are there. Um, that's that's maybe the personal advice. Um, because you can you can overthink anything, really. Um, I mean, be aware of, of what the risk you're taking, but really figure out what you need to do when, when something is, is just there and not like fix everything entirely and then overthink it. Uh, what we can do within the industry is um, well, part of, of, of uh, what Johanna said is, is create, um, well, um, a community of understanding, um, look for role models, but also, um, like, look to yourself, what do you, what kind of role models do you have, and, and, and how can you be a role model for others, and, and how, how can you hold up that, that standard, really, and, and, and encourage that, but, um, set a positive example. Um, do I everything do everything that that helps support that? Not everything will will be ideal, um, of course. But um, if you don't go ahead and start it, then it won't happen. Cool, Melanie. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I'm not sure if there's um, much more to add. Maybe one from a personal experience. I think it's much more much easier to be authentic and be yourself when you're these days when you're in a senior position um, because as um, Tina and Patricia said before there's still these kind of unwritten rules in different worlds and you need to learn them however it's really important I feel that we actually change them and it's as we if you are in a position um, you have to you have to do this and often for me that's just being able to be authentic to address topics that maybe have never been addressed before to just be yourself and not um, necessarily as a woman try to be like a man. I think um, for me at least this feels like this can slowly change also the way we work with each other and really addresses and um, often it's not only women that then feel better, it's often also men because um, it could be an openness to be able to say I'm not feeling very well or I'm really I'm sad at the moment, I need help or something like this. I think we should be able to create a work culture that these things are possible but just to work with more like humans and then um, I think this will be better for everyone. I think with that optimistic kind of like a closer, thank you very much. Tina, Patricia, Ioannis, Melanie, and thank you, 
our amazing audience that joined us today. Um, we are in the virtual space, I guess, all of us on LinkedIn and everywhere. Yeah. Feel free to reach out. And uh, back to you, Zuin. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all for joining. Thanks. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, just quickly make a note of goodbye to the people who've been watching until the very end. Quite a, quite a lot, actually. Thanks to everyone who moderated, uh, pitched, and discussed today. It's been really great, inspiring to listen to everything in the background. And based on the input along the way, I believe uh, others felt the same. Thanks to our partners in this event, Better Future Conference, Porsche Digital, and the Welt am Sonntag. Uh, and most, most of all, thank you to all of you who watched at home and asked great, great questions. You make uh, doing this fun for us. And we hope to be able to welcome you again soon in our physical space where I'm standing right now. Um, but until then, you can tune into our Pitch Tuesdays every Tuesday happening at uh, 5 o'clock Central European time. Uh, if you go to apx.berlin slash pitch Tuesday. Uh, and as more mentioned, we have our next investor event for female founders with more than 50 investors from the DACH region offering free office hours uh, taking place on November 13th. If you want to stay tuned with uh, what we do here at APX, the events we are part of, you can follow us on uh, social media. You can check out our website. This is a moment where I just quickly bring up how you do that. Do that here. There you go. Thanks to all of you for being a part of this event. It was great fun. Have a lovely evening. Bye.